nephew, but he uh, I see only two in there. Okay, everyone, uh, welcome back to GSS. Uh, today is the most happy day of, like, of this semester for me because this is the first analyst. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, just a quick announcement. Um, I'm trying to organize a media conference. So if you want to speak, um, just let me know. It will be a 20 minute talk format and you'll be talking about your research. We want to get to know about everyone's research because as a department, I think that we don't have enough uh, communication with each other to know each other's research. So this, I think, is a good opportunity for us. Um, okay, so let's get back to business. Um, I'm trying to tell us something about fluid dynamics. So, the PD we're going to look at today, or the PDEs, are the 3D compressible Euler equations. I'll explain what, well, you know what Euler is, you know what 3D means. I'll explain what incompressible means. This is fine. Thanks. But this <laughs> Sorry? It's really fake. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so what is the P you want to solve? Ah, yeah, OK, this is better. So you fix some time horizon t. You fix some initial condition u0. Uh, we're going to work in the torus just to not worry about sort of integrability stuff. Just work on something that's flat but compact. So, this is some vector field. So this is the data we're given, and then we seek a velocity field u. And some pressure p. So these are our two unknowns. Well, two unknowns, but there's really four scalar unknowns. And we want them to solve, well, 3D incompressible Euler, which is DTU plus U dot grad U equals minus grad P. So this is on zero T cross the torus. Then we want what's called incompressibility. Divergence of u has to be zero. Again, on zero t cross the torus. And we have some initial condition. Our velocity at time zero is as given. Um, I'm not going to jump into discussing. Well, the goal for sort of the, the meat and the interesting stuff about the talk is discussing sort of interesting solutions to this and interesting properties of solutions to this. But I'm not going to jump into that right away. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time just telling you about where this PD comes from in terms of the physics behind it and what is the physical interpretation of those things. Um, it's easy to write down some random PD and solve, um, well, it's easy to write down some random PD, but I'm going to try and motivate why this one is interesting. Um, just to be sure, make sure we're all on the same page first. Uh, this this notation there with the u dot grad u thing. So this, right, let's take a step, step back. Um, I said we have four scalar unknowns. We have four scalar equations, right, a vector one and a scalar one. So at least the, like that very rough check, um, we passed that check. We have as many equations as unknowns. Now, this thing, the ith component of that well, it's what you expect. You dot these two guys, so you get, oops, sum over j, u j, partial j u i. Because uh, this term is the only nonlinear term in the whole PD, so it's fairly important. We better know what it looks like. I mean, be clear on what the notation means. And then you'll see that as, as, as the talk goes on, we'll pretty much forget about the pressure for most part. Um, and the reason is that really we can 
recover the pressure in terms of the velocity once we know it. And why can we do that? Well, if we take the divergence of the first equation, this term drops out because u is divergence free. When you take a divergence here, um, when you hit that guy, you'll drop out. So you'll just pick up one term from here and then you'll get a Laplacian of p. So what it comes out to is that when you take a divergence, you get that minus Laplacian of p is equal to what comes out to this. So the basically a square of the gradient of u. The exact form is not too important. What matters is that we recover p from u. Right? And for example, it looks funny that we don't have an initial condition for p. It is because it doesn't matter. We just recover it from u anyway. Um, and the pressure has sort of a physical, I mean, this is just saying, OK, we can get rid of it. But there's a physical reason why um, the pressure is determined by the velocity. We'll get to that when I say a bit more about what this incompressibility condition means. Yeah. Maybe just to standardize the semicolon yeah. stuff. Uh, yeah. So if I have two matrices, A semicolon B, I'm just summing over IJ, AIJ, BIJ. That's the standard inner product on matrices. Yeah. Good question. OK, so this is the P we're looking at. Where does it come from, uh, <coughs> physically speaking? So as Sun said, this is, about, this is a talk about fluid dynamics. So this models the dynamic of a fluid. And if you start with some blob B0, and you blob a fluid and you let it flow. And that's called the flow map, a fancy F, also known as phi. So then you blob at time t is there. And what you really want your flow map to satisfy, well, you want it to flow along the velocity you're given. And at time 0, you want it to just be at identity. So this just describes the dynamic of our blob of fluid. How does the PD come out of that? Well, where's the color chalk? There it is. So if this is how we're modeling our fluid, uh, while we're like, describing our fluid, where do these terms So where does this dtu plus u dot gray u come from? Well, if I want to describe my fluid and I want to keep track of the velocity, I need to see how it changes over time, right? So let's just compute that. If I have some uh, little point in my initial blob p, and it goes along with the flow, and it ends up at some, let's call it x, which is phi of that point p at time t, then I want to know how u evolves at that point. Right? So if I look at the derivative of u at tx, this is really the derivative at u of t phi of pt. Right? And so when you differentiate this, you can give this to a calc I guess three student technically, um, and you can do it. So because you have your chain rule showing up here, so you get what? You get dTU at T phi, so Tx, plus then grad U times dT phi. So grad U at Tx times dT phi at uh, Tp. OK. Um, but this, this is the same thing as your, uh, which way do I want to go about this? Yeah, this guy is the same thing as just looking at u at tx, 
right? So the point is that this whole thing gives you that dt u plus u dot grad u thing. So what is this guy? This is just the acceleration um, of my point particle, of my of particle of my fluid, right? So we're looking closer to the most basic physical physics uh, equation being Newton's second law, right? You want to write f equals ma, you need to know what the acceleration is. That's what this is. And so then it's hidden over there, but we had this thing equals minus grad p. Grad p is a restoring force. Where does it come from? It comes from the incompressibility. So let's talk more about the incompressibility. Uh, so where does this guy come from? Well, let's say that we want to compute the volume of my blob. Okay, well, this is what? This is just the integral of one over the blob. Okay, fine. Which is, if you, since this is the image under phi, you just change variables back to b0, and you get the determinant of your phi showing up. Uh, let's go over dp. So, to know how the volume changes, I, know, I need to know how this guy changes. That's just, again, something that a Calc 3 student a dedicated Calc 3 student can do. Uh, DDT of dead grad phi. Um, well, hold up. Let's not do that right away. Let's talk about how to differentiate the determinant first because it's cute. Um, how do I want to do this? Let's do it this way. Okay, let's change color because this is just an aside that doesn't really have to do with PE anymore, but it's fun. Um, I want to differentiate this guy at some matrix M0 in the direction of some matrix V. And I claim I'm going to get determinant of M0 trace of M0 inverse V. Um, can you read this? Not really. OK, yeah, fair enough. This was not the best idea. The formula is a bit obscure, but that's not meant to be literal. Uh, so I want determinant at M0 trace of, um, yeah, I don't know about you, but the first time I saw that, I didn't know where it came from, but it's very straightforward if you write it the right way. So I'll just do that <coughs> because it's fun. Essentially, all you have to do is Remember that determinant is a nice homomorphism that takes multiplication to multiplication. And then you just need to differentiate at the identity. But then you have characteristic, characteristic polynomials that tell you how to do that. So it's, the point is, this is pretty, deriving this is pretty cute. Uh, because, let's write it this way. Um, yeah, so. The determinant takes the group of invertible matrices to R with multiplication. It's a nice homomorphism. Everything's very good. And then the derivative of the determinant ID identity, uh, D prime ID identity, you can compute this to be the trace, right? And this you just do because you do, uh, yeah, the characteristic polynomial expansion stuff. So this is pretty, right? The determinant is the product of the eigenvalues. So the linear part is going to be just adding the eigenvalues. But this guy takes what? It takes the tangent pace to that guy. I mean, this is slightly overkill writing it this way, but it makes the picture clear. And it takes it to the tangent space at one of that guy. So then if I want to know what the determinant at M0, derivative determinant at M0 is, what do I need to do? I need, so this is going to go from, I'm differentiating around M0, the same thing, and I'm going to something around determinant of M0. Uh, and because these things are nice, you just know how to go from those to those. Here, just multiply by M0 inverse to go from M0 to the identity. And here, you multiply by determinant of M0, which is what this formula there uh, packages together, right? So because it's a homomorphism, you just need to do it at the identity. And then this is where the formula comes from. Um, 
There's also a way to derive this that's a horrible computation. And then there's that. I prefer that. So why do we care about this? Because we wanted to see how the volume evolved over time. We have to take a derivative of the determinant. We know how to do that now. So let's do that. Let's see what comes out. Um, let's do that here. Where are we? Yeah. So, so d d t of the determinant of grad phi, well, it's right there, right? So we're going to get determinant of grad phi, and then the trace of the inverse, and then the time derivative of grad phi. It's just the chain rule again. Yeah. And the nice thing is, you just compute whatever this is. And unsurprisingly, this guy looks like what? Well, looks like a time derivative, but there's a gradient as well. So dt of phi is basically u. The grad of that will give you grad u. And this comes from basically uh, changing variables in the sense that this whole thing comes down to grad u at phi. So this is very nice. I just have determinant, the derivative of the determinant is the determinant times the trace of this, which is going to be the divergence. So that's where the compressibility comes from, because if I want to keep track of how the volume changes over time of my blob of fluid, I just need to keep track of the divergence of u. So that's where the compressibility comes from. Um, yeah, so let's, let's, let's write that. <laughs> Right, so we have uh, we have that DDT of debt of grad phi is dead grad phi, and then the divergence of u at phi. Okay, that's a dot. That's a composed. So what does that mean? It means that uh, if phi at time t is uh, orientation preserving. Because I can't have cheated, right? Like the stuff that was over there was the absolute value. So it would be nice if that thing had a sign and then I've actually computed its derivative. Well, if it's orientation preserving, that tells me the determinant has a sign. So if this, then the volume of my blob at time t is what? The integral, uh, sorry, I don't, do I want the volume? I want the derivative of the volume. doing fluid dynamics. We want to see how things change. So you put the derivative inside, and you get the div divergence of u at phi dp. And then you change very, oops, no. We did that as well. We need that because we're going to change variables back. I mean, that's all you do in PE, right? You change variables, integrate back parts, and things magically work out. Uh, so this is integral over bt of the divergence of u. Just, uh, you know, dx. So to ch I have my blob of fluid, and to see how it's going to change volume over time, I just need to look at the divergence of u. OK, so all right. And of course, uh, I mean, here this was just saying, OK, that I really want the determinant to have a sign. But remember, the actual PD we look at, let's write this down. The, the PD we look at, uh, phi is the identity at time 0. So the determinant is just 1, so it's positive at time 0. And then if you're divergence free, um, that's going to be preserved. So the point I want to make is that the point I want to hammer home is that the flow being volume preserving is the same thing as the, f the velocity being incompressible. Right. And so here the other way is that, uh, yeah, if divergence is zero, then <coughs> then the determinant is constant, and it's 1 at 0, at time 0. Um, so this guy is orientation preserving for all time. Orientation preserving. And the volume doesn't change.
So, yeah, the punchline. This incompressibility that was in our PDE, and that's a condition on the velocity, is really the same thing as requiring that our flow be volume preserving, which is a more physical, like, it's easier to, it's, it's like a physical conservation. So, incompressibility equal to volume preservation. And so I'm sort of deconstruct, like uh, telling, trying to tell you where the parts of the PE come from. Really, when you derive it, you kind of go the other way around. You start talking to a physicist. He tells you, look, these things have to be conserved. Tell me what comes out of it. And that's kind of where the PE comes from. Uh, but that would take longer to explain than to reverse engineer the PE. So, so yeah, let's just recap what we have about what the PE means, or like the physical interpretation of the PE. What do we have? Our PD was the DTU plus U dot grad U equals minus grad P. And the divergence of U oops, is equal to zero. So this whole thing was really the acceleration. And this is really some force that is acting to make sure that our fluid stays um, like the flow map stays volume preserving. That's really what this thing is doing. That's what the pressure is doing. Um, now, for those who've seen, who've done some physics at some point, you'll be saying that there's something missing here. Newton's second law really tells me that F equals M A, I have no M left over. But that's fine because, um, as I was saying a minute ago, we derive these things from conservation laws. The most important one is conservation of mass. You don't want your fluid to just gain or lose mass for free or by magic. So, there, so then if I have something that is mass preserving and volume preserving, my density is going to be constant. Our favorite constant is one. So there's a one here. That's why this is F equals ma. This is the usual uh, Newton's second law. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is uh, a brief justification of the 3D incompressible Euler from its physical derivation. Um, I know not everyone is a fan of physics, but everyone on board so far? Okay. So now that I've said a little bit about where the PD comes from, let's start talking about interesting features of solutions to the PD. Um, and one that's particularly uh, important from the physical perspective is, well, generally, f you know, things that are useful are conservation laws, things like, or preserve co conserve quantities. So things like the volume being preserved, that's useful. Uh, another more important one is that uh, if the solution is nice enough, we have something that is the kinetic energy that's conserved. So let's see where that comes from and what that looks like. Conservation of kinetic energy. So this is something physicists care about because if your model doesn't conserve energy, they're going to say it's bogus. And this is something mathematicians care about because conserved quantities give you control and solutions which allow you to, you know, start somewhere um, when you're studying them or trying to just prove they exist. So let's say that we have two solutions. Well, we have solutions, a pair U and P. Let's say they're infinitely differentiable to make life straightforward for now. So we have a velocity and the pressure, both nice and smooth. Um, suppose they solve. Let's call it E for Euler. Solve E. 
Son, instead of the fancy mic, can we get a bigger board? <laughs> I know this is not up to you, but uh, I'm, I'm struggling. Oh, I can crop that out and put it on the website. There. Sorry? I can crop that statement out and then put it on the Alright, so let's say that we have like very regular, so like as regular as we want solutions to this, and then uh, let's see what conserved quantity pops out. The, the general way we get conserved quantities in PDE, or like, like a very common way, is you multiply your PDE by the right stuff, and then you integrate by parts. In this case, we're not going to do anything fancy. You multiply the PDE, the first one, by U, and you integrate by parts. So let's do that. And when you do that, you're going to get what? You're going um, right. to... Can I do it here? Yeah. Fine. So, 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 so. You multiply by U and you integrate by parts. So you multiply by U, and then you get uh, an integrated in time and space. So you get 0t. I don't want to do this here. OK, so integrate in space time, and you multiply, you've multiplied by U. So this dotted U, and then So you have your u dot grad, u that comes from the PD, and then you multiply it by u. And on the right hand side, we just had minus grad p. So minus u dot grad p, and you integrate in space time again. <coughs> okay, so two of these terms are nice to just integrate by parts. You move the derivative on the other one, and you get, no, you don't move the derivative, you just, you just pull the derivative outside. And you'd get, uh, yeah, I don't need to integrate in time. I mean, it just makes it clearer to see what happens if we don't. So let's not do that yet. We'll do that later. Uh, so here, you just get the derivative of the integral of half u squared. That's the kinetic energy. That's the, it should, again, it should be mv squared, but m is 1, the density is 1. So, so this is fine. Uh, this guy, nice and easy, you integrate by parts and you get a divergence of u, which is zero. So this goes away. Nothing to see there. Uh, this one, you have a little bit more work to do. So let's write it like this. Let's write it as u i d i u j u j. So then when you integrate by parts, you'll get two terms, one when it hits that guy, and one when it hits that guy. Uh, when you hit this, you get zero because it's a divergence again. When you hit the other one, so you get zero. And then the other one looks like what? Looks like, so ui uj, and then your di hits the second uj. Um, but if you rewrite this, this is just, this is exactly what we started with because you have u dot grad u, and then dotted with another u u dot grad u dot it with another u. So that thing is equal to minus itself, so it's equal to zero. So I kind of gave it away with the title, but the energy, the kinetic energy is conserved, right? Um, now there is one thing which uh, we sort of was perfectly innocuous when we mentioned it earlier, but this works because u and p are nice and smooth because all this integration by parts makes sense because U is at least differentiable, and you know everything is nice. Now, um, the question is, when does this like how how nice does a function have to be for this integration by part to actually carry out and be justified? And so, how nice does the function have to be for the kinetic energy actually to be conserved? And uh, and this is not just a mathematician sort of trying to push the assumptions to the weakest possible thing. This is relevant for physics. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, I'm told it's relevant for physics <laughs> when it comes to turbulence. Because if so, uh, yeah, here comes the horrible picture. But if you have an aero airfoil thing and you have airflows, 
it's sort of nice and good and everything's good here. And then it kind of goes crazy here and it becomes a horrible mess, um, which goes by the name of turbulent flow. And these things are, like the, the, the flow of this fluid is modeled by the Euler equation, the compressible Euler um, in 3D. And so what happens here with the solution being very irregular is related to what happens. So, you know, the solution is very irregular. We want to know um, at what point it breaks this conservation of energy. So, so let's have a look at that. But before I do that, yeah, so, well, let's, let's just state the question. Um, but then I'll have to tell you a bit more about what do we mean by less regular solutions in the sense that we have a gradient of u in our PDE, so I would probably need u to be differentiable. Turns out you don't, so I should probably tell you what it means for u to solve the PDE if it's not even differentiable. So I'll do that in a second. Yeah. Is there a physical relevance when you use this uh, logic? Uh, well, think of it, okay, so uh, later we'll get solute, well, we, like, I'll quote some very clever guys who get solutions that are uh, like compactly supported in space time. So it doesn't matter if you're on a torus or, or over three, like it's, uh, the point is we don't, you could, I'm fairly certain you could do R3 with the right integrability conditions. Um, yeah, because the, 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 I, I think the point is that this is, you, you want to highlight the regularity of U, not sort of decay at infinity. Like that's not the interesting, that's not the issue here, I think. I'm just asking like, Okay, look, so physically, once the energy is not conserved, we're in no man's land, right? Like, it's not physical anymore. Um, energy is not conserved. No, I mean, like, so, why, like, physically, what, why, why is your domain charged? Like, what does that mean? Uh, okay, I don't think I do know of actual physical systems that are shaped like a three-dimensional torus, no. But um, as a way of modeling what happens in the interior of a fluid with away from the boundaries, this is as good as we have, right? Because if you introduce boundaries, I mean, I'm kind of lying here because part of like when I'm referring this example as an, uh, an instance of issues with the kinetic energy we conserve, because here there is a boundary, there's stuff happening with that, right? But the turbulent flow can happen in the interior as well. It's just this picture is more uh, commonly seen. I think I kind of skirted around your question, but I don't know if. It's okay. It's a math topic. <laughs> um, and, and I guess maybe when solving numerically, um, you they use periodic. Assume you, you are like, if for example, using four years to solve it, you, you just assume the domain is charged. Yeah. You, don't care about you use periodic boundary also, conditions yeah, and yeah. things, yeah. Um, yeah, so like, I guess the point is it's not just mathematicians doing that. Engineers who have simulations to make will sometimes just do that too, I guess. Um, and also having boundaries makes it really hard. So, all right, so the main question that uh, will be answered by the end is how regular, understand sort of smooth, like how spiky, how regular do U, P have to be for the kinetic energy to be conserved. And Onsager in 1949, so a while back, conjectured, so Onsager in 49, he says that you being held or continuous with index one third is critical. Meaning anything more regular will conserve energy, anything less regular will not. Um, so yeah, I should remind people what these Helder spaces are. Also because remind, reminding, uh, the def like recalling the definition will uh, start giving us a hint as to why we should have a one-third. So recall, for alpha strict, strictly bigger than one, so, uh, well, in there, uh, 
you can measure u this way. You can look at how u uh, changes with respect, you know. If alpha is one, you just have the usual Lipschitz stuff. The point is you want to say that the growth of u between two points distance d apart is like d to the alpha, right? That's what you're saying here. And uh, remember, if I have a continuous, like a function, let's say everything's on a compact set, so let's say it's continuous, its derivative is continuous, then it's C0 alpha for all alphas, and then it's, uh, it's you know, C01 is Lipschitz, which is in blah, which is, uh, what am I doing? Uh, yeah, this is fine. Uh, yeah, so, so there's sort of intermediate regularity between continuous and uh, continuously differentiable, right? So, which is kind of what we want. We want sort of a scale of regularity and we want to hit just the right spot, which is critical for, uh, on one side, energy is not conserved, on the other one it is. Um, there's other fancier ways of writing these scales involving Fourier transforms and uh, Littlewood Paley stuff. This is just buzzwords for the analyst. Um, okay. Why one third? And this is a very, very coarse explanation, but it kind of shows up in the proof of one direction of this conjecture anyway. Like for the showing that energy is conserved when alpha is bigger, strictly bigger than one third, the very rough heuristic I'll give now uh, does sort of show up in the proof in a significant way. So, so what is the heuristic? Well, why one third? Uh, when we're asking how regular the, the solution is for the kinetic energy to be conserved, we're asking how regular does it have to be for the integration by parts to be carried out. The troublesome term was the nonlinear one, right? So the troublesome term is this uh, integral of um, u dot grad u dot u. Oops. And very coarsely speaking, we have one derivative And, well, one derivative for three terms. So that's where the, let's say, that's where the one third comes from. And, and honestly, it's not, it's not, I mean, this is obviously very coarse, but it's not too far off. This is really what's going on. And that's kind of what you do when you do the Fourier stuff. You just, you know, you write this thing as a derivative that you can split into fractional parts and put on each guy, sort of, kind of. Um, I think I'll get to the proof of the energy being conserved when alpha is bigger than one third, and you'll see this kind of popping up. Anyways, we have a problem because uh, we want to solve a PDE that has grad u, and we want it to be not even differentiable. So what does it mean? Well, it means we've weakened our concept of a solution, so I should define what that is. I was asking earlier if people are allergic to physics had questions, allergic to analyze, analysis, or what's... Just, um, good question yeah. about that. So that integral over there, you have it in every dimension, right? I know that these are the only things I'm Yeah, to yeah. Agree, so is the one third in the band of the I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm not going to, yeah. I don't know. So there is, there is, uh, I'll get to it later for the, at the end, for the case where alpha is strictly less than one third, I think they've only proved it in 3D, and there's a specific reason for that. That isn't really this thing, that's something else. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll get more to, I'm not, I'm not aware of any dimension dependent issues at this stage, they are definitely cropping up later. And I'll, I'll point them out then. Okay, so let's define weak solutions because we want to know, we want to have a notion of solution that doesn't require u to be uh, differentiable. Okay, so, okay, I, I said we're going to want u and p to be non-differentiable, but we're going to start with them being smooth just to motivate things. Mm -hmm. 
suppose we solve our favorite, uh, okay, it's not there, so I should write it again. DTU plus U dot grad U equals minus grad P, divergence of U is equal to zero. Uh, let's not worry too much about the initial condition right now. It's not, it doesn't matter too much for what we want to do. Okay, so if I have a nice and smooth solution, um, I can do the standard uh, PDE stuff and multiply by something, integrate by parts, see what comes up. We did that with U, but now let's do it for some arbitrary um, test functions. Then for any phi test functions, so yeah, compactly supported, say on like, well, I guess they're all compact sets, it's fine. On the zero T cross the torus into R3. So multiply the PD by phi, integrate by parts, see what pops out. So you do this and then yeah actually let's even forget about zero t let's just do it on r let's forget about the initial condition for now uh, so you integrate by parts and you get what so you're integrating over r the torus you have dtu dot phi, and then the troublesome term, so u dot grad u dot phi equals minus uh, phi dot grad p. So we basically did this earlier, right? So this guy, you get what? Um, yeah, so okay. I. This guy is not compact anymore, so I want this guy to be compactly supported. So then this you can integrate by parts and you get, you just shift the derivative, nothing too fancy. I mean, nothing fancy, but now I don't want u to be differentiable in time anymore, which is kind of the whole point of doing this. So that's nice. This you integrate by parts and you get the divergence of phi. And this guy, um, before doing this, I should probably yeah, let's write it out in coordinates. So this is ui partial i of uj. Then you have a phi j. Um, so yeah, what's going to happen when you move this over? When you hit the ui, it goes away just as before because u is divergence free. And then when you hit this guy, I'll just get a derivative there. So you're going to end up with ui uj di j, which we'll write in a fancier way as u tensor u semicolon grad phi. And so this is a typical trick you do to make sense of solutions to a PDE that are not differentiable. You just move all the derivatives on some arbitrary test function. Um, so if we add everything up, So phi was arbitrary, um, which means we can pick it to make the equation look nice if we want to. In particular, remember that p doesn't matter if you have u. So if we pick phi to be divergent free, we get rid of p. So let's do that. So in particular, let's say i.e. If, if phi is divergence free, then um, it's integral of u dot dt phi plus the integral of u tensor u dotted with grad phi is equal to zero. And so that's going to be our definition for a weak solution. So we say that u, okay, so what is the, like, an, what is a, uh, a nice, like a simple requirement on u to make sure that this is well defined, well, we have a u, like, essentially squared here, right? Like a, yeah, bilinear thing in u. So if u is in L2, then this thing is well defined. If u is quad integrable, then this thing that looks like a square is well defined. So u in L2 on compact sets is a 
weak solution of Euler if star holds for any test function phi that is smooth, compact supported, compactly supported, really meaning compactly supported in time uh, for any, oh, and I forgot, divergence free. So that's what we mean by a uh, weak solution. Does that make sense to non-PDE people? Okay, good. For those that are still awake. Uh, okay, good. So remember uh, here, so these things, you know, the, the, these weak solutions show up all over the place because it's easier to find weak solutions than strong solutions, right? That's the typical way that analysts see them first. But um, in this case, we really needed this notion because we're expecting something to go wrong for sufficiently irregular solution. Um, something to sort of go wrong from really the physical interpretation of this model. So there's sort of a, this is a nice, I, I like the situation because there's sort of a physical motivation to really looking for weak solutions. This is not just a technical tool that uh, helps us just mathematically finding some solution in some abstract space somewhere. And remember in particular, we wanna answer Onsager's question about what space is critical for energy to be conserved. He conjectured it to be uh, C0 one third, and turns out he was right, as some people proved uh, very recently. So let's do a quick uh, lit review of uh, these cool results. Sort of like historical uh, snapshot of proving Onsager right. So remember, Onsager conjectured this in uh, 1949, so quite a while back. And, uh, and one direction showing that sufficiently smooth solutions do conserve the energy, that was proved um, a while ago in uh, 94, but it still you know, took a while. Although, well, okay, that's not entirely fair. I think it was probably proved before that, but these guys have a really slick proof that's like four pages long. It's really straightforward. They do hide a bazillion details, but uh, it's very readable. It's a cute paper. So this is Constantine uh, and TT. And so they proved that U in C0 alpha, alpha is strictly bigger than one third, then uh, energy is conserved. So this is sort of the easier direction that happened uh, further a while back. But then came, okay, so this paper from 07, this is not, they didn't prove the, well, okay, I'll tell you what they did um, and then put it in context, I guess. So these two guys, Delelius and Zekalehidi, they proved what? So they did something that was, pretty remarkable, which is that there exist some weak solution, so very weak, just L infinity weak solution. Okay, but nothing, this is not where it's interesting. The interesting part is that, um, let's say, com with, with space-time compact support. Um, so let, let's think about what this means uh, physically. They weren't the first to do it. Uh, Schnurman did it 10 years before, but their method was uh, sort of like generalized so nicely that then they pushed these results very far and that's where we got the really cool stuff from very recently. And they're still pushing it and I'll get to that at the very end. Um, but so, so let, let's think about what this means physically, right? So this is, uh, this is saying that you put your glass of water, cup of water, bottle of water, whatever, your container of fluid, you leave it overnight, you leave it at rest. This is not even a good example, but you leave it at rest. <laughs> and then spontaneously, it starts moving and doing all sorts of crazy things, and then it just stops again. 
Um, and that, that's, what, that's what it means to be compactly supported in space time, right? Like at time zero, it doesn't move. At time t is efficient large, it doesn't move. And in between, it does all sorts of crazy stuff. We'll say more. So when I was saying that their method was so powerful, was like generalizable and nice, it's been pushed to sort of uh, say how crazy these things can be. And I'll say more about that in a second. But uh, this, is, this, is, this is already pretty cool. You get uh, absolutely non-physical weak solutions. But now the next natural question was, how far can we push this? This is U bounded. This is very far from C0 one third. So then they push it. And that took about 10 years, um, which takes us to the last couple of years. Like the next couple of results, these guys proved this when they were postdocs. It's freaking incredible. They're pretty good. Um, so in 2016, I one S. I said prove that when alpha is strictly less than one third, or it's right in a similar way. So uh, there exists U in C zero alpha or ah no. I gotta I gotta get the quantifiers right. People in concepts will be mad. <laughs> For alpha and one third. They're using U and C0 alpha um, such that, what? Well, such that um, compactly supported in space time. In space time. Um, I'll say a bit more about sort of, okay, about how this was done. Um, the, the sort of the tool that they used that then generalized nicely and allowed people to then push it all the way up to here is what's known as convex integration. Um, I think who are like Gromov and Nash had to do with that to start it off. Um, I'll say more about like very, very vaguely how that works. Um, but so he really pushed it up to the critical space. And then the thing that's even more remarkable is so all these lovely people, like these two guys, the Lilis, Zikalahidi, uh, Buckmaster, who was a student of the first two, I think, and Vikal, um, so what this showed was, so sort of a refinement of this, that for any alpha less than one third, for for any for any energy profile, so from um, zero t to strictly positive numbers, there is a solution. There is u c zero alpha um, weak solution such that its kinetic energy is exactly as was prescribed. So half u squared is equal to e of for all time in your time interval. Uh, so this is, this is, to go back to the bottle example, you tell me, uh, I think they can fix T as well. You tell me like in that amount of time, all my energy to go to do all sorts of crazy things, they can find a weak solution that does that. Whatever the energy profile is, you can make it go up and down and do whatever the hell they want. I mean, it has to be smooth, but fine. Um, the solution is, you know, isn't, that's the whole point. So. They can, they can get this. So, and they, they even show something about, uh, so they have like a better category stuff showing up that, that is interpreted as saying that the uh, like dissipative solutions, like at that regularity level, dissipative solutions, solutions that don't conserve energy are sort of typical. They're sort of like everywhere. It is their typical solution doesn't even conserve energy. Um, so these are, these are really great results. Um, and this is, this is just, this is weird, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it tells you how bad things go as soon as you go below this um, critical level. Let's see. Okay, so now, watch. Well, take a pause now to make sure. Is, it, is there any questions about what these results mean or like what's going on here? Yeah. Does that mean the equation is wrong? <laughs> uh, it means that uh, it means that our notion of weak solution obviously is not physically meaningful, right? Um, or, well, that's not 
uh, maybe I shouldn't be so categorical. What, what they do say is that at this lower like, regularity, at this such low levels of regularity, this has to do now with turbulence and these sorts of things. I don't know enough about that to uh, give more precise details about what they mean, how the, the connection between this and turbulence. Um, but if, if there is physical relevance, that's where it is. It has to do with turbulence. That's what I'm told, and that's what they say in all these papers every time. Um, it means, you know, you, right, I didn't say it, but for, for, for smooth initial data, you have smooth solutions for short time, right? So like if your data starts nice enough, everything's nice. Like it's, uh, I guess what I want to say is that this is about the interplay of the weak solutions and the equation, right? It's really like saying something about notion of weak solutions, not just the PD. Uh, and, and also to sort of go back to uh, the way I was uh, motivating, or not motivating, but when we're talking about weak solutions, I was saying, you know, analysts see that usually the first time as sort of a technical tool to find solutions easily and stuff. But the point is, as this, uh, clearly shows, you know, it, it matters a quite a big deal what solution space you're looking in, right, looking at, because uh, all sorts of crazy things happen. So, uh, yeah, the, the physical buzzword for the relevance of this is turbulence, but I don't know much more. Yeah. yeah um, one, I don't understand is that why do we consider hold up continuous when we're considering a weak solution? Because like, these two things, like, usually they don't well, what, what do you, so you don't do it together, I mean. Okay, fine. If you want to phrase it in terms of Sobolev things, these guys don't prove it for this. They prove it for some best of space that's like B3 infinity alpha, I think, because you want it to be like L3 integrable with like alpha derivatives and L3 type of thing. And this one is like kind of like the second index for Lorentz spaces stuff, because they do this with Littlewood Paley. This is like how you sum your things. Point is, they prove this in something that looks more like a civilized space, right? Because that's what these guys are. So, uh, look, you have L2, you have C infinity, you want to find where it stops in between. They do prove it there because, of course, that uh, scale is finer than the Helder spaces scale. So they do prove it there and prove a strictly sharper result. Um, so, I, I guess you, you are right. You don't have to stop at Helder. You can do finer scales, like finer... Uh, you know, yeah, finer refinements of like regularity and stuff. Does that answer your question? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. the yeah. reason is that by so long, I think, uh, we know that HK space is compatible. Yeah, exactly. You can, say, you can say a bunch of stuff about, uh, you know, you could, like, yeah, you know, I guess there's like, you could, you could play around with the integrability and um, regularity and DCs and stuff like that, I guess. Well, but you don't have enough integrability, right? Um, Yeah, you're going to need a lot of derivatives to get into, yeah, so uh, point is, this is getting too specific to uh, analysis, but um, this is a coarse way of measuring regularity. They do prove it for a finer, for a finer thing, yeah. Any other questions about what those results are? Yeah. So what do you mean by that? Uh, so, so, so basically, like, um, I'm looking for a partial converse of s s like this result in proof of last year. So you're saying that given any energy profile, you can find solution, right? Mm -hmm. So when I say, OK, I'll give you some like, really rough solution, and then that satisfies the whole uh, equation. And then what do you want to do with it? Okay. Yeah, that's a solution to Euler, and then what do you do with it? It depends what you mean by something that looks like a Brownian motion. If you pick a Brownian motion to be like what are they called the the fractional ones? I don't know, Hurst indices things. Is that what they call these? And you pick the one that matches to like this regularity. Yeah, you can get like I don't know. You can get you know Helder, you know. Whatever one less than one third, and if if you get solutions that are just as regular as some fractional brain motions, I guess yeah, sure. Uh, we can talk more about this at the end, like afterwards, if you want. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so I guess let's just give a very very quick sketch of uh, this result. 
um, where we'll see that this very rough heuristic that you split the derivative on like the three terms give you one third. We'll see kind of how that shows up here. Uh, and then I'll give a very, very, very rough sketch of um, the convex integration stuff that goes behind these, just a sort of a very hand wavy um, argument. Oh, so yeah. Sorry, well, one very quick question. Sure. So the, the, this result shows that, okay, uh, when alpha is less than one third, the, the result doesn't hold, and mm -hmm. the energy is not conserved. Mm -hmm. So what happens when, when yeah. it's above? Uh, when it equal to a third, right? E equal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, when it's above, it's conserved, right? When it's above, it's conserved. Oh, oh, okay, um, yeah. Add one third. I think this guy has a paper on it. Uh, I don't. I don't remember what it is, but you, yeah, if you if you if you look look him up, he's got something about what happens at one third. Um, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it really goes from above it's conserved and below it's like it fails to be conserved in an arbitrary way, basically. So. Okay, so a very quick sketch of this thing. Um, right. So, a big sketch of this paper from ninety four. Um, so what, what, what they're going to do is uh, basically look at the look at the weak formulation, test it against sort of an um, like a smooth out version, like a modified smooth out version of the solution. Test it against that, and together it parts a bunch of time, and then they get a remainder that they have to control that you can send to zero precisely when alpha is less than one, uh, bigger than one third. So let's sort of just sketch that. Um, so we're going to take our test function from our weak formulation to be, so you modify your solution twice, where by modifying we mean that we convolve, like, yeah, we just take a running average convolution with, right, so any function f, f sub epsilon, I just take sort of a running average at scale epsilon, that's what this means, um, but more precisely, phi epsilon is just a rescaled version of some reference phi, Think of this phi as like some like nice symmetric uh, like probability distribution, sort of like compactly supported Gaussian type thing. Um, something that averages out to one. So smooth. Let's see again on the torus. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, really. And then it's between zero and one. Uh, the integral is one. And it's symmetric, also known as a standard modifier. Um, they have all sorts of nice properties. We'll use a bunch of them, but I'm not going to write them down because we're going to skip those steps anyway. Um, but just to give a rough sketch, one thing that's probably worth noting is that um, so if I have f and g and I'm taking a running average of g, this is the same thing as taking the running average over f and then of g, because sort of averages of averages, you can just move them around. Um, so this is, this is sort of why you have this average, like this modification twice, because then you move it onto the other guy, and so you get, cause remember this guy, so you get like u acting on something with phi, so then if you have this guy modified twice, you move one of those on u, and so you get u epsilon twice. Um, so, so once you have that, you plug that into your weak formulation, and you get that integral over torus of your kinetic energy of the modification at time t minus the kinetic energy um, of the modification at time zero is equal to uh, this remind remainder, so integral from zero t over and over torus of Right, so, th so this is just one of the terms in the weak formulation, and this one we already integrated because remember here, like this guys came from, we had some, um, we had what? We had u acting on dt u epsilon epsilon. So you move this on this guy, you take the dt outside, and you get this. That's what comes out. 
Uh, this should be capital T probably. The same as over there anyways. Um, and so this is not the term you have to control. It makes sense that it's this one because it's a nonlinear stuff that always messes you up. Uh, so yeah, let's just rewrite this as you move the modification, like one of those on the bilinear term. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna wave my hands a lot, but the details are in their paper and if, if, if you've played around with convolutions and modification enough, they're fairly straightforward. But uh, the key thing is that this, this star term, so you want to send it to zero when epsilon goes to zero, right? Because then this is equal to that, so energy is conserved at, at the modification level. But modification is super nice, you can always pass it to the limit. So if it's conserved there, it's conserved in the limit. So I just need to show that this guy goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. And, and why does it? Well, you just sort of um, see how epsilon interacts with the regularity of u. So uh, u epsilon is a running average at scale epsilon. So when I have a u epsilon showing up, I'm going to have an epsilon to the alpha coming out, right? Because that's how, like, u on the scale epsilon, if it's in C0 alpha, is going to change like epsilon alpha. That's the whole point. You fix this power law of the ratio of u to the domain. So, so, so from, like, every time I hit one of these guys, I get an epsilon to the alpha. So I get epsilon to the alpha, epsilon to the alpha from these two guys. I mean. This doesn't come from there. You split this up in a bunch of terms that you can handle, but they all give you these things. And then this guy, well, I get another epsilon to the alpha, but I also have a derivative. Uh, derivative of this, uh, I'm going to end up hitting that guy, taking epsilon outside, so epsilon to the minus one. That's where the minus, the, the, the minus one comes from the derivative. So it really is three u's and one derivative. And so, okay, and then you have something that's like, uh, like a u to the c0 alpha type thing. Uh, this is like like the best of norm type, so I was going to show up whatever norm we're showing up. I'm going to put this in quotes. Uh, the right functional norm of u shows up. So then this, which is epsilon to the 3 alpha minus 1, goes to 0 as epsilon goes to 0 um, when alpha is bigger than 1 third. So when alpha is bigger than one third, you can just pass it the limit and send this away. Um, and even in the proof, they say, even the, the way they do the proof, they say that it has something to do with turbulence because you're looking at sort of averages and apparently lots of ways to sort of analyze turbulence rigorously is to look at statistical properties, which are averages. So apparently there's some deeper relation even in the way you prove this, uh, which I guess gives you sort of like, what I'm trying to say is that modification is the standard tool for PD, but also in that case, it's telling you something about averages which apparently is relevant to the physical picture here. But I, again, I don't know much more than that. This is sort of just paraphrasing what they say in the paper. So, so this is a rough sketch of when things are regular enough, energy is conserved. And now for a very, very rough sketch of the other direction, well, not the other direction, but the other, uh, on the other side of the critical space, when things are not regular enough, uh, you get all sorts of wild things. And how you do, do you build these wild things? You build them with convex integration, uh, which I, I don't really know why it's called convex integration, but uh, I can give you a very rough sketch of what they do. So, a very vague sketch. Of, uh, well, convex integration, which is what they use in all those recent papers, sort of starting in 2007 with that big paper by De Lillis and Zikalehidi. Um, they didn't start that, that, that doesn't start in 2007. That was used by, uh, yeah, Gromov, Nash, for like fancy things uh, a while back. But this is sort of the power, the powerful tool that allows them to push these results. Um, they're even using this for Navier Stokes now. It's, it's really, yeah, it's really impressive what they're doing. Um, but sort of the, the very, very rough sketch is that the, they reformulate the PD. So the PD we have is this. Okay, I'm writing it slightly differently, but if you push this inside, um, you get a D view which goes away because it's zero. And then you hit that guy and you get the term you had before. And you have divergence so equal to zero as well, but uh, just for clarity, we're gonna suppress that for now. So you write this in, in a different, you sort of change, uh, change variables basically. You solve instead, DTU plus, sorry, divergence of S plus grad Q equal to zero. 
I mean, this is going to sound almost like this is too simplistic, but uh, you know, they start from a nonlinear PDE and they get a linear one with a nonlinear change of variable. It sounds like nothing, but the, then they do some what allows them. So yeah, so this is you know, uh, blah minus blah. Where you need so yeah, they get uh, these pointwise constraints. These are not PDEs anymore; they're just you know constraints. Uh, so you start you write a nonlinear PDE as a linear PDE subject to nonlinear constraints, and then what allows them to do here is that they have a linear PDE, so they can do all sorts of Fourier stuff and they can just sort of add oscillations as much as they want. And what happens is that uh, they'll add oscillations to things that don't satisfy this, but does have satisfy the inequality version, and they sort of push uh, them all the way to the boundary of that set there up to equality, basically. Very, very, very roughly speaking. Um, but one thing that's interesting is that, for example, they, um, this is where, this is, this is where uh, I know that they really rely on 3D because they need to, so they're going to add sort of like plane wave type solutions that are supported on lines. Uh, you can't really fit a lot of lines in 2D that don't overlap, but you can do that in 3D. And they call these things uh, Mikado flows, I guess, because that's what Mikado sticks look like. Uh, so the point is, there's like some interesting geometry to the 3D style that you can do there. Um, and yeah, I think I've been speaking for way too long, so that's it. Yeah. So why is the Onsager's idea for putting that alpha bigger than one third? In Where? Did, how did you come up with one third? Yeah, I mean, like for the reason we can tell, but I mean, Onsager didn't come up with that idea, right? Yeah. So, so he had some he had some different argument about more sort of Fourier series based stuff, and sort of uh, I, I think that yeah, he was doing. Um, he, he was doing, yeah, so I mean, everything, like, he, he already knew, I mean, everyone knew that if any term was going to give you trouble, it was that one. Like, that was, that was guaranteed. Um, and so you look at what happens here on the Fourier side, and you end up with some power law in, like, the, how the frequencies, uh, how the amplitudes have to behave at different frequencies, and sort of how, what is it, the, um, how sort of energy has to shift from different Fourier frequencies to another, and you get some sort of power law where that one third comes up. That's sort of the derivation he has. There's a quick, um, in, that, in that paper by Constantine O and TT, they mention sort of the statistical analysis type of idea that he's doing uh, on the Fourier side, sort of to, that's where the one third comes from. Uh, but but they also make an argument that their, their formulation of the um, Onsager conjecture in terms of Helder spaces is sort of a pathwise version of what Onsager did on sort of a statistical analysis type thing. Again, I'm mostly paraphrasing, and I don't know so much more about what Onsager did exactly, but it was something to do with frequencies and Fourier stuff. Uh, yeah. Also, also just to be like the, you know, they did prove that in some best of spaces that you know weren't sort of widely used back in the 50s, I think. So there's also sort of the technology wasn't quite there, I think, but perhaps, yeah. What about Navier-Stokes? Yeah, so Navier-Stokes. So uh, Navier-Stokes is the same as Euler, but there's, uh, thanks, Giovanni. Um, <laughs> there's a minus Laplace in uh, U here, which uh, is really nice and regularizes everything. So like this PD should be a lot nicer, but they're still pushing the same convex integration techniques to get uh, horrible solutions to this that are like non-unique and uh, do crazy things and all that. So this is this is very recent. They had like a paper, like August last year, or like earlier this year or something. Like the I raised the name, but like Buckmaster and Vicol have some paper about, uh, yeah, like these crazy solutions to Navier-Stokes. They're not quite Luray solutions. They're weaker than that, which is why everyone is not panicking yet. But they're pretty close, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, so that's why, yeah, that's another. Uh, demonstration that this, these, these convex integration techniques are pretty damn powerful because they're pushing them uh, all the way up to never stokes. Um, the, the, physical, the physics behind why this is nicer is that this is viscosity, so it's telling you that the fluid uh, sort of rubs off on, e like neighboring phys fluid particles rub off on each other, so they sort of drag each other along, so there's not sort of sharp gradients in the velocity that happen because of, of this sort of, that's hand waving the physical meaning behind why this is these solutions are nicer than Euler. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, uh, speaking of 
Well, like other conserved quantities, or what do you mean? You, I don't. What do you mean? Like what? Yeah, but you well. Look, I mean, part of the problem with Euler and every yeah, that's I was going to say yeah. Something is conserved. Your name it as energy. Like part of the part uh, of the no, so Kevin. Okay, Yeah, so Kevin, the part of the issue with why Euler and Navier Stokes equations have resisted like so long is that we don't know many conserved quantities or sort of monotically decreasing and increasing quantities. We don't have that many of them, right? Like when they find the the, the last guy who came to a colloquium, he was at Pitt, uh, Alexis Vassell, right? He had this whole like Vassell murder entropy for some compressible Navier Stokes stuff. So just the fact that they have a, con like some not even conserved quantity, but con quantity that decreases the entropy allows them to get all sorts of control and stuff like. The point is, it's really hard to find conserved quantities or quantities that, you know, are, are monotone. Uh, and if you, when you do, you get a lot of stuff out of it. And uh, so, so people, I guess people are trying to do that, find conserved quantities and quantities that are monotone. It's just very hard. Uh, but yes, once you do find one, you get all sorts of great stuff with it. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Let's thank.